And we are live. This is Rob Rowe, standing in for Debbie Dashinger of the Dare to Dream podcast. And I am extremely fortunate to be here at the Conscious Life Expo in February 2019 with Robert Schock. Robert, thanks for coming on the podcast. Well, it's my pleasure. All right. So... There's so much to talk about with your work, but let's assume for a moment that our listeners are familiar with the science that you've presented and taking it as, as I think, a good reference point where people can always go back to if they want to examine the science. You did a phenomenal podcast with Joe Rogan back in uh, May of last year, and you took pretty much the whole first half of that podcast. It was about a three-hour conversation, and you took about the first hour and a half going over the science of why what you believe is what you believe. And it, ha- it has to do with some, uh, some geophysics that you're an expert in, you're an expert in geology. Uh, I believe uh, you have some uh, academic training in anthropology, archaeology as well. So you've used all of these tools to uh, formulate kind of a revision of what our history is about. In the year roughly uh, 9700 B.C. is extremely important so let's briefly, you know, just take that as a point in history. What happened then? What was going on before then? And particularly, we can get into some other ancient civilizations as well, but in particular, uh, what you talked about with Joe was the Egyptian civilization and uh, a way of rethinking that history, and the uh, Gobekli Tepians as well, which uh, ha- had a very advanced civilization around the same time. And I don't know if uh, they were in communication with the Egyptians at that time. Maybe they were. We can get into that. But around 9700 B.C., if I can remember correctly, correct me if I'm wrong here, there was a solar event that uh, induced what you call the solar-induced dark age, which caused a lot of cataclysmic events, a lot of flooding, a lot of lightning that uh, you know, really set these civilizations back. So... What happened after that, the solar-induced dark age, the the Egyptian renaissance, if you will? So let's start there. Can you just fill our listeners in on a little bit of that backstory? Sure. I mean, you actually did a great summary of it just now. Really, I think this was a pivotal time. And yes, you're correct. It's 9700 B.C., so almost 12,000 years ago. And that date is quite secure because we have isotope data from uh, cement cores, from ice cores in Greenland. So there's a lot of very good science behind this. And at 9700 BC, we were literally snapped out of the last ice age. So people know about the ice age. And many times people think of um, cavemen and woolly mammoths, et cetera, et cetera. But what we've now established with my re- my work on redating the Great Sphinx and also the work on Gebekli Tepe in southeastern Turkey is that before the end of the last ice age, before 9700 BC, there was what I call a cycle of civilization. Very sophisticated people on earth. They had developed what I believe we can legitimately call true civilization with monumental sculptures, advanced, sophisticated technology compared to anything before and compared to what happened for thousands of years after that. You know, Mm -hmm. there was a huge decline. So we have this advanced civilization, sophisticated, true civilization before the end of the last ice age, 9700 BC, as you just mentioned, there was a major solar outburst, a major ex- major explosion of the sun, and this not only changed climate dramatically, and in the ice cores, we can see that this happened within not years, not within months, but literally within days, and as far as we can resolve it, it was probably literally overnight, which would correspond to the sun essentially erupting, exploding, an outburst. We have evidence of this on the moon. We have evidence of this around the world. We have evidence of this engraved on rocks, what are known as petroglyphs on the sides of huge boulders. We have this actually recorded, and this is something that Katie, my wife, first put the pieces together, what's known as the Rongo Rongo script from Easter Island, this mysterious hieroglyphic script we now believe was inspired or actually records. And the tablets that have 
exist nowadays are copies of copies of copies of copies, but it all goes back, all this evidence goes back to the end of the last ice age. People were recording in part, literally what they saw in the sky during this major solar outburst. So we have all this diverse evidence from archaeological evidence to uh, evidence in my field, my PhD is geology and geophysics, that indicates there was something major happening. We have vitrification, strewn fields of glass that were caused by this solar outburst. In some places you had what would have been comparable to huge lightning bolts literally hitting the surface of the earth, flash melting surface rock and then it refreezes again, melting glaciers literally overnight. This would cause um, earthquakes and volcanic activity, which we now know is correlated with solar activity. So it was massive flooding. Massive flooding. I was going to get to massive flooding because you're putting all this moisture into the atmosphere the atmosphere could only hold so much moisture, so it comes down as rain. I mean, we all heard about the biblical 40 days and 40 nights of rain. No, this was even more massive than that. And so you would have flash flooding, you have rising sea levels. I mean, it was absolutely devastating times. And when you have sophisticated civilizations before this happened, I mean, they were literally brought to their knees. They were brought back to a much more primitive level. And that's what Katie and I, my wife Katie, Catherine, Ulysses, and I call the solar-induced dark age that you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. Or we use the term sometimes SIDA for short, S-I-D-A, solar-induced dark age. And this was a period from approximately 9700 B.C. when this all occurred to about the middle of the fourth millennium B.C. So let's just say round numbers 35, 3700 BC. So if you think about that 6,000 years, that civilization was brought to its knees, metaphorically, in decline, much more primitive than what had come before, before it went through, we could use the analogy of Europe, a renaissance and a reinvention, if you would, or I shouldn't say reinvention, sort of re rebooting of civilization reemergence of civilization. Um, my wife is here, and she just reminded me if you heard the voice. In fact, Katie, say hello. Radiation, well... Uh, uh, yeah, she, uh, we talk about this so much. Something that she was starting to mention is radiation. Go on. Yeah, aside from the things that would be right in front of your eyes to deal with rising ocean levels, to deal with massive rains, to deal with vitrification and fire and incineration, you have the invisible radiation. If the event was so severe, that it stripped the magnetosphere, or my husband's the geologist and the scientist, but um, but that really explains the die-off of large mammals at the end of the last ice age. It sure. explains why those who survived the incredible cataclysms would have to go underground. The rock is what would give you protection from radiation, mm-hmm. and so... So the story, that can explain why it takes 6,000 years to reboot and why civilization reboots in certain areas like northern Mesopotamia where there's structures to to, uh, protect people. In in China, in, in, you know, pockets, pockets reemerge. What what we find in this, there's lots of independent evidence of this that is now all converging. We find that at the end of the last ice age, there were pockets where people survived, humanity survived. So classic one that Katie and I have visited several times and we've been studying is in Anatolia, Turkey, not far from Gebekli Tepe in northern Mesopotamia. Cappadocia region, and many people are familiar with the underground cities, the huge underground cities in the Cappadocia region. Now, traditional archaeologists, status quo, conventional thinking is that these only go back a few thousand years. And I admit that when you go there, you find evidence of Roman occupation, Byzantine occupation, Hittite occupation. But like so many sites, what we're piecing together is that these originate much, much earlier. They were being used, they were being reused, they were being reworked. But in fact, this goes back to the very end of the last ice age when these catastrophes occurred. People had to find a place to survive. Uh, Humans are large mammals. We now know 
based on the paleontological and geological evidence, that there was a huge die-off of large mammals at the very end of the last ice age. Why? Because they couldn't find places to escape. Uh, radiation levels, the havoc going on the surface of the earth. Small animals, like little mat, rat, little mice and rats, that type of thing, they can go into crevices, etc. Mm -hmm. Certain animals will go into caves, bears, for instance. Humans will find shelter in caves, mammoths will. So it all starts to tie together. And I want to, before I forget, in Anatolia, you have a pocket of people that survive and then spread out again. And we see this, for instance, in independent studies of linguistics and the Indo-European languages, and their core can be traced back to the same area, the same pocket at the end of the last ice age. Well, let's have a little fun for a moment. And I, I know that you're... Any speculation you do is is very careful because uh, you don't want to go out on a, on a limb into any kind of you know fantasy world or anything like that. But let's think for a moment: what were these civilizations really like pre ninety seven hundred B C? How far back did it go from there? Do you think? Speaking of either the Egyptians, Gobekli Tepians, or or anywhere else, what, uh, and, we, and what did those civilizations look like? What m might they have been capable of in terms of their technology or any skills they might have? I mean, th this is a very, very difficult question because we don't have a lot of physical evidence for them. What we have are primarily large stone structures, and that makes sense, I think, when you start looking at it in this context because you had all these calamities occurring. You had literally um, wildfires occurring. You had what would have been looked like huge lightning striking, setting off fires. You had all these, um, uh, you know, storms. You had uh, all this rain, et cetera. Anything that's organic, anything that would burn, for instance, you can't really expect realistically much of that to survive. So what survives? The large stone structures. Now, what do those represent? In terms of the civilization, it's hard to put everything together. But let me say, they, their abilities to carve large, massive stone and to arrange them, to orient them astronomically, we find all kinds of sophisticated astronomical orientations, I think is the tip of the iceberg metaphorically that these were very sophisticated cultures. Now, we don't have evidence that they had iPads and or the equivalent, or electronics, that type of thing. But we do have some very interesting evidence that is just developing. So, for instance, my colleague Manu Saifzadeh and myself have been looking at some of the carvings on the pillars of Gebekli Tepe. And this just came out this month. We published in an academic journal the hypothesis and we'll see how it's received, that they actually had writing. And that one word on one of the pillars, based on looking at later scripts that were used in that region that may have kept some memory of it or have um, evolved from it, we think we've identified symbols on one of the pillars that literally means God. That may be the first written word that can be recognized, which is pretty exciting because if you put into traditional context, writing and literacy are supposed to be one of the hallmarks of sophisticated civilization. Absolutely. According to the standard conventional scenario, you don't have writing and literacy until the fourth millennium B.C., we're now talking the 10th millennium B.C. That's a serious so thousand, game changer, isn't it? It's a huge game changer, and before the end of the last ice age. And think about it this way. Right now, if we had a huge, devastating catastrophe, and all you had were a few big concrete, you know, not billboards, I guess, but, you know. Yeah, skyscrapers on skyscrapers, Wilshire, and somebody came along 10,000 Yeah, yeah, years and, and one of them has a name on it, you know, or some letters that <laughs> symbolize, you know, acronym Chase or Bank whatnot. Or yeah, <laughs> what you just say, that's, oh, that's just decoration. They weren't literate. It's just, it's just 
decoration, you know, random decoration. Well, but we think that's not the case. And, and I've been thinking about this for a long time. It's hard to make the point with such limited data surviving. But Let's I some believe these guesses here. Yeah. What, what can we infer? Uh, from that. Can we infer there might have been some communication between the Gobekli oh. Tepians and the Egyptians oh, I th- and, I have, and the South American question? I actually the- have no doubt personally and part of this, I always base my beliefs on evidence. So I want to distinguish here. You have evidence and you can say things factually mm-hmm. and then you can extrapolate from that reasonably. Sure. Yeah. So based on the factual evidence and extrapolating re- what I Reason, what to me is reasonable, I have little doubt that certainly there could have been interchange between Gebekli Tepe in northern Mesopotamia and what is now Egypt. Mm-hmm. You know, we don't know what they called themselves. I might refer to them as the Gebekli Tepe people. That's actually just a Turkish term for the local site. I mean, mm-hmm. they didn't call themselves the Gebekli Tepe people. We don't know what they called themselves. Likewise, the Egyptians in what is now Egypt in, say, 10,000 B.C. We don't know what they called themselves or who they thought of them, how they thought of themselves, but I'm convinced that dynastic Egypt, thousands of years later, was a reemergence from that earlier civilization, just as I'm convinced that there was a reemergence in Mesopotamia from a legacy. You, you, a legacy. These are legacies, yeah. There's some good evidence, uh, very good evidence for, for that on on the Rogan podcast. That's when right. You talked about the stone sculpt, uh, stone vessels, That's and right. the sophistication of their creation. Correct. That it was actually a higher level of sophistication earlier on. That's right. And then they maybe started to lose some of that technology as time went on. Exactly. So at the emergence. Uh, you, you spoke of the idea of uh, making an analogy to the uh, monasteries in Europe during the Dark Ages, hanging on to bits of knowledge from maybe the Roman times up until maybe we started having our Renaissance and that sort of thing, a little more sophistication, but all during the, you know, maybe, you know, 400 to, to 1000 AD, something like that. There were probably pieces of knowledge that were held on to and passed on generationally and so on. So uh, it's, it's a very good uh, hypothesis that, uh, uh, some, something similar might have happened only a much longer time period. We're talking that, thousands of years instead of hundreds of years. That's exactly it. That's exactly it. And I think that's an analogy which I've used, and I'm glad you brought that up, that people can relate to because we know that this type of scenario, these types of phenomena have occurred in the last 2,000 years because we've seen it with the European Dark Ages and pieces of knowledge being held onto. In some cases, if we use the analogy that you just mentioned of the monasteries during the dark ages in some cases they were holding on to pieces of knowledge things that they knew were somehow important and fit into a bigger picture even though they also realized it was only fragments at that point and they didn't have all the pieces to put it together and what we see in the European renaissance is when they start putting all these pieces together and then you have a reemergence. I And based on the evidence, I'm convinced that you had the same thing happening over thousands of years after the fall of these very sophisticated civilizations at the end of the last ice age, and slowly fragments were brought together, the population built up again. This all takes time, and it can take a very long time, especially when you have such an incredible cataclysm. Well, let's, let's at the for, end of the last ice age. Well, let's, let's for a moment get back to when these civilizations were thriving. Um, I, for, for one thing, uh, let, let's just take a guess. Let's say they were thriving for 5,000 years or something I like that. I think that's a pre, quite reasonable guess. Pre, pre-9700 BC. Yeah. So there were a lot of things going on in different parts of the world, and that's a whole other discussion. But I've always been very curious, uh, you know, I've... You know, looked at a lot of people who make these comparisons, you know, the Eric von Danica and the uh, uh, Zacharias Sitchin people and all, all of that. What is your opinion of the relationship between uh, the pyramid cultures, to use the term loosely, of uh, South America and maybe, you know, some in Eastern Europe? I know there's a huge one in Bosnia. Uh, these different type of cultures around that time, do you think there might have been any, you know, interchange? Be- okay. you know, I, I, okay, so the, let, me, let me make a couple of comments, and I don't want to go off on a tangent, but since you mentioned Bosnia, mm-hmm. 
Bosnia is not real. In my okay. assessment, I have been there. I've studied it very carefully. I think that it, it's just wrong. Mm-hmm. It's that they're not ancient pyramids in Bosnia. Okay. So let's exclude that for a second. Okay. On the other hand, we have genuine ancient structures in other parts of the world. And, you know, maybe we'll find them in more parts of the world. I think we will as we continue looking. Let me give you uh, an example of something that is real in my assessment from having studied it and knowing the people involved with it, but having Katie and I got to look at on site. That's Gunan Padang in Indonesia on the island of Java. There you have an incredible structure that is now well dated geologically, geophysically, by radiocarbon, etc., back to the same time period, going back to the end of the last ice age and even before the end of the last ice age. Gebekli Tepe itself, Klaus Schmidt of the German Archaeological Institute was the um, excavator of it until he passed away, unfortunately. It's still being excavated by uh, the German Archaeological Institute and the Turkish archaeologists. But before he passed away, he was talking about how it's a huge site and he had only been able to excavate a very small percentage of it, and other portions of it might go back thousands of years earlier. And when you look at the pillars that have been excavated, I find evidence, and actually, not to put words in his mouth, but I believe before he passed away, he was acknowledging this too, Klaus Schmidt, that some of these pillars that we find at the end of the last ice age, which are dated right before the cataclysm, and actually some of them apparently were being used and reused as the cataclysm was happening, Uh, some of those go back much earlier. So think of a museum now, or even today in Rome, you go to the Colosseum. The Colosseum is still there. It's still being visited, still being, you know, used more as a tourist attraction. Mm -hmm. But there was incredible continuity, I believe, right up to the end of the last ice age for these cultures. They didn't just pop out of nowhere, in my opinion. They must have had precedents going much earlier back. We see them at a culmination point when they are brought down at the end of the last ice age. You go to uh, a classic one as Tiwanaku in Bolivia, and I've been there, Katie and I have been there a number of times. I've been studying that. I'm not sure I want to make any kind of definitive conclusions about it, but I'm also more and more convinced that the standard archaeological story does not hold up to full scrutiny. Yes, it was being used 2,000 years ago. There's no question in my mind about that, but dynastic Egypt, I'm sorry, ancient Egypt was being used several thousand years ago. That doesn't preclude that both were legacies of much earlier civilizations, and again, reemergence, rebuilding on much earlier sites, both physically and also intellectually. So I think we have this continuity, and we have very much, when I say we, academia has neglected interchange and connections around the world in very ancient times. When I was an undergraduate and graduate student, the standard dogma was that if you were on different continents before Columbus, you didn't interact with each other. And that's totally broken down now. Mm, We now know that, for instance, the Shang, and this is later than the period we're talking about, but still thousands of years ago, there's very good evidence that the Shang Chinese made it to the Americas. I mean, oh, really? we have literally inscriptions in oh, good that. sites. Yeah, I mean, people don't talk about this because it's against the standard dogma, the standard conventional theory. And then when you go further back in time, you see all these correlations and very specific correlations. People can say, I wouldn't put a lot of emphasis on pyramids okay. in isolation because, you know, pyramid is very fairly big, stable structure, but when you have pyramids that are in the same types of correlations relative to each other, pyramids that have the same proportions, one side of the world to the other, now you're talking things where it starts to really stretch the imagination to say all this is just 
coincidence. You know, Robert, uh, I've, sadly, we are uh, going to have to give up this room here pretty soon. Let me ask you just uh, real quick, uh, what would you like to do? What's next for you? Uh, let's just dream, uh, since it's the Dare to Dream podcast, what if you had unlimited resources? What questions would you like to answer? What projects would you like to do? And how might our listeners get involved with you if uh, they are interested oh, in furthering this kind of work? Well, okay, so let me put a plug in for uh, Oracle. There is actually a nonprofit, 5013C, is that correct? C3, I don't know, whatever it is. It's a legal nonprofit organization called Oracle 501C3. Is that what it's called? Yes. 501C3. And uh, we're involved with it, but it's not just um, Katie and myself. There's a board of directors independently. And it's we call it Oracle, O-R-A-C-U-L. That stands for Organization for the Research, Research of Ancient, Ancient Cultures. Cultures. And people, if people go to my website, which is www.robertshock, R-O-B-E-R-T-S-C-H-O-C-H, they can find links to Oracle. So that's one way to with crudely help support financially, etc. The other thing that I'm doing, I'm a Boston University faculty member. I've been allowed to open a little institute at Boston University, um, ISOC, Institute for the Study of the Origins of Civilization. So I'm very excited about that. And something with unlimited funds. If I had unlimited funds, I love my teaching, I love my students, but I would free up my schedule from so much teaching so that I could pursue these other research projects research project I'd like to pursue, let's get down to that, the chamber under the Sphinx. That's a big thing because under the Sphinx is a chamber that Thomas de Becchi, a geophysicist myself, first found uh, working with John Anthony West, who passed away last year. Some people may know who John Anthony West was. Fantastic guy. Yes, fantastic guy. I'm a very close friend, very good friend. Miss him dearly. But we found geophysically this chamber under the left paw of the Sphinx. Ever since, I've been wanting to get permission and funding, which is going to be considerable funding. We're talking lots and lots of money. This is just what it costs to do good geophysics and this type of work to get under there. We even have now textual evidence that there is a chamber under there that ancient dynastic Egyptians of the earliest dynasties was some of the earliest writing that we know of from Egypt. Now, I mentioned writing from Gebekli Tepe. That's thousands and thousands of years earlier, but according to the traditional dating of writing, some of the earliest writing actually talks about the chamber under the Sphinx. So what kind of records are there? Because they talked about it being ancient records 5,000 years ago was ancient records. Absolutely. So there's things like that. There's the what work on Easter Island, I dearly want to do. This work in Indonesia, I dearly want to do. So I have more projects than we can count, and I know we've run out of time. We will absolutely make sure our listeners know about that. We will put in some show notes and some links. You have our email, and please send us any uh, any links or any information that you would like to have added to this podcast that we can uh, share with our listeners and help spread the word about the work that you're doing, which is fantastic work, and I'm honored that you took the time with us today. Thank you very much, Robert. And Thank Katie. you. Thank it's you. a pleasure being here. Thank you. Rob and Debbie Dashinger of the Dare to Dream podcast signing off at the Conscious Life Expo.